So Ms. Olivia she's teaching Ian Todd, who is an associate and professor, so, 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 associate professor and reader in cellular immunopathology at the University of Nottingham. In addition to that, for generations of junior doctors, uh, Ian wrote the Bible, the textbook of immunology. So many doctors throughout the world have been educated by him through reading his pages, and we're delighted that he's here with us. And Ian's been researching in lupus for 20, 25, how gray, over 30 years. And he's going to tell you about some of this work. But it, it really just segments the fact that to improve the care that we know that everybody needs, there are various levels of research that we can do. Some utilize the existing healthcare data, and Francis has told you some information about that. Some of the ways in which we do research is to test new drugs and test new treatments and see what happens. Ian's work is very much to going back to the laboratory and looking at how we can use new advances in medical techniques and science to develop new treatments. So without any further introduction, Ian, uh, we've got new drugs for all. Thank you. Uh, it's a great privilege, I must say, as well as a pleasure to be here to uh, speak to you this afternoon. Um, as Peter said, um, together with Peter and other clinical colleagues, we've been involved in uh, lupus-related research for 25, 30 years, which is the time that I've been working at Nottingham. Um, I used to work just a few floors below Peter, I've got you now moved to South Block, from West Block. And I, yeah. We've gone down the road from the F to the A floor. <laughs> from West Block to South Block, if you ever see. Um, well, I, I spent 29 years in West Block on A floor, which actually just in January moved over onto the University Park campus, uh, into the Life Sciences building. Uh, which uh, I must say, I don't regret. I'm, I'm now looking out at trees rather than looking out at people who are so uh, that's quite nice. Um, so, as you see, the title is New Drugs for Old, and I'll come on to explain what that actually means uh, in a few minutes' time. I want to give you a, uh, an introduction as to, what, to why that title is relevant. And so I'll give you a subtitle as well, um, which is Understanding Lupus for Better Diagnosis and Management. Uh, and really, that's, that's one of the things where we're aiming at, as, as Peter said. Our work is very much laboratory based, it's what we would call basic research, but it's also what we would call translational research, meaning trying to get a better basic understanding of uh, mechanisms of disease in order that that can then be translated into the clinic to better diagnosis, management, and treatment. Um, as well as clinical colleagues like uh, Peter and Francis, I'd also like to, on this slide, introduce you to my scientific colleagues in the in our research group. That's uh, Dr. Lucy Fairclough and, and Dr. Paddy Tai. You can see, you can see I'm a senior member of the group in age. I think we're equal in terms of uh, seniority, but in terms, certainly in terms of age, I'm the senior one. Um, so, uh, we call our group the MBTI Research Group, um, which I'll come on to explain in a minute. But actually, just on a, on a side, that so I thought it would be worth mentioning, you might be seeing this slide. Um, we've heard a lot about stress management this afternoon, um, and that's clearly a very important aspect of management of conditions like lupus. Um, Another different area that our group's been involved in, um, particularly uh, Lucy Fairclough, um, and it was actually reported in the press, in the papers, and, and on the TV about a week ago, was some work we've done with uh, some psychologists at Nottingham University, looking at the effect of stress on the efficacy of flu vaccination. And so what that study has shown is that people who are actually less stressed when they have their flu vaccination, make a better response to the vaccine. So again, that whole area of psychoendoneuroimmunology, um, it, it is true, it does work actually. Okay, so MBTI Research Group, what that does, uh, that's actually stands for, is Mechanisms, Biomarkers and Therapy of Inflammation. So those are the things we're interested in getting a better understanding of. 
in a range of inflammatory diseases, but also particularly uh, in lupus. And what we're meaning there is in thinking about lupus mechanisms, so what we're trying to look at is what may actually help to trigger the development of the condition in the first place. Why do some people get lupus and other people don't get lupus? Even people with the same genetic background, because obviously there is a genetic element, but then somebody gets it, somebody doesn't. Why might that be? And then what cells and molecules within the body are involved in the condition, allowing it to develop and keeping it going, and therefore could potentially be targeted to better control or manage the condition. Biomarkers, so uh, Francis talked to you about earlier in meta-diagnosis, and certainly a key aspect of that, as well as uh, understanding people's actual presentation of signs and symptoms, is better getting a better hold on those what markers in the body, what we call biomarkers, that can be used as a kind of flag to say, hang on, this might be lupus, so what molecules can be detected to help to identify the and how then all of that can lead towards a better, better therapies for lupus. As we've heard about earlier today, um, therapies are improving for lupus. There are new things coming along. You've all heard of the biologics, and there are now a range of biologics and so on. There are new avenues of study, and that's some of the things we're involved in. Uh, and we'll come on to talk about that in a few minutes' time. Now, I know that looks a bit frightening, but that is our model for understanding what's going on in the body in lupus, okay, the cellular and molecular mechanism. So this is the mechanisms bit. I know there's an awful lot there, there's all sorts of cells and arrows and molecules and there's even a cigarette on there. Um, we're going to break it down and we're going to start with something which Francis mentioned earlier on, Epstein-Barr virus, just normally called EBV. Epstein-Barr virus sounds awful, but in fact, probably everybody in this room is infected with Epstein-Barr virus. Or certainly over 90% of us are. So I'm probably infected with Epstein-Barr virus, I say probably virtually everybody else is. Because it's uh, a virus that infects virtually everybody in the human population worldwide. Most of us acquire it as children, we're not born with it, it's normally passed on by kissing, so probably kisses you get from your parents give you Epstein-Barr virus. If you get it as children, you'll never know, because it, it, you get with no symptoms. Only if people get it if they're in their teens or early adulthood, they may well then get glandular fever, because it's a virus that causes glandular fever or infectious mononucleosis. And then they, they got it for life as well, then. so once you've got it, you've got it for life. Although everybody's got it, it can do nasty things, as well as give glandular fever. It can cause cancer, possibly could be responsible for up to 2% of cancers. And it can cause, or it can be involved, potentially, in causing autoimmune diseases. One is multiple sclerosis, and another possibility is an involvement in triggering lupus. <coughs> so what Epstein-Barr virus does is, when it gets into our body, it actually infects our, infects our B lymphocytes, one of the key white blood cells, indeed one of the main cell types <coughs> is then involved in lupus. And being a virus, when it gets inside a cell, it makes hundreds of copies of itself, which then are released and can go, can go on to infect more cells. But the very clever thing about TB is that it can then become what we call latent. It can seemingly disappear, but it's still there inside ourselves. It's just it's not showing itself. It becomes latent. But it can then get re triggered, and then you get the re emergence of the virus. Now, how the uh, body control. So, so the question is how, how, and in what way might this be involved in uh, the triggering of? Just one bit of information you see from some work we did a, quite a long time ago, it was published in 2005. There's, there's a lot of data that supports this. This is just, just one little bit from some work we did. This was where we looked at a uh, response to Epstein Barr virus in lupus patients compared with uh, normal controls and people with other types of conditions. 
And what this is showing here is that around about 50% of lupus patients have evidence of a, an active response against Epstein-Barr virus, indicating there was activity of the virus in the body, which was much higher than the level seen in our control population. So that's just one little bit of data saying in lupus patients there seems to be unusually high levels of activity of Epstein-Barr virus. Now, I mentioned we've got a cigarette on there, so I was quite, I was quite pleased with myself when I drew that on PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah, that looks quite like a cigarette. Anyway, um, the reason I put that on there is again the nasty things that smoking can do. Again, it's been mentioned several times earlier this afternoon. Everybody knows smoking causes cancer, there's no doubt about that. Everybody knows smoking uh, can cause heart disease, there's no doubt about that. Probably what is less well known is that smoking can also help to cause autoimmune diseases. Again, it's a proven factor in rheumatoid arthritis, it's a proven factor in multiple sclerosis, and there's also evidence for a link between smoking and lupus. Now, of course, many, many people who've got lupus have never smoked. It's not saying you know, have to smoke to get lupus. What it's saying is people who do smoke have got a slightly increased chance of developing lupus. So, how might, how might we tie those things together? Well, first of all, how does the body normally control EBV, this virus that is actually present in all of us? How is it that we can live our whole lives with this virus, but it, most of the time it's never a problem? Well, that's because our immune system normally controls it. And how it does this is by this very important cell here, that is in our blood and in all of our tissues, and we just call it an MDC. Okay, it stands for myeloid dendritic cell, it's an MDC. That can activate what's called T cells, and T C cells can kill virus infected cells. That's one of the main ways that our body controls viruses, is by T C cells killing other cells that have been infected by viruses, such as the virus EBV. And EBV itself can activate the MDC cells, which activate those cells, which kill those cells. So that's the way our immune system controls the virus in our body. But another question we then ask is, so what effect does smoking have on these critical MDC cells? So, I want to introduce a bit of technology. Reverse phase protein array. So this is something that me and my colleagues, uh, particularly more so than me, Dr. Faker and Dr. Tai, do. Uh, this is a relatively new form of technology for measuring things. Okay, measuring things. Now these squares here, the red one and then the green ones, are microscope slides, glass slides. I haven't actually got one, but I folded a piece of paper to say. They're about that size. On that size, actually a piece of glass that size, we can measure 40,000 things. Okay? Potentially, anyway, certainly thousands of things. Each of those little dots you see on that slide is measuring a different, what you might call, biomarker. So we can then use that technology to measure, literally, as I say, thousands of markers at the same time to give us <coughs> massive information that we can then uh, interpret. So we've used this technology to look at the effects of cigarette smoke and nicotine, which of course is the main addictive component of cigarettes, on those MDC cells. Now you don't need to really know anything about the details of this experiment. All you need to know is that each of these columns here in the colours represents MDC cells from a different person. And each of the rows going across represents measuring a different molecule in the MDC cells that's involved in activating those cells. And the more red it is, the more that molecule is activated, and the more green it is, black through to green, the less activated it is. So on the left there, where there's 
a lot of red, that's just the MDC cells on their own treated with an activating agent. <clears throat> then going gradually across from the left to the right, we've added either increasing amounts of cigarette smoke or increasing amounts of nicotine. And what you can see goes from more red to more green. What that is telling us is that cigarette smoke and nicotine <coughs> inhibit, suppress those cells. And by suppressing those cells, they make them less able in the body to control things like Epstein-Barr virus. In other words, the cigarette smoke or the nicotine in cigarettes is suppressing our immune system in terms of its ability to control the viruses. So that's what we've got there. The cigarette smoke suppresses this cell, which means it can't activate the TC cells, which means the TC cells can't kill the, the infected cells, which means more Epstein Barr virus can be made in the bodies. So that's not proof, but that's a, a model for trying to understand why smoking may actually mean that someone is slightly more likely to develop lupus or multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis. <coughs> than somebody who doesn't smoke. Um, in this case, I potentially lose. Now, another molecule that has been recently found to be expressed in lupus patients in the bloodstream that's at higher levels than is normally the case is a molecule called interferon alpha. Okay, there's a lot of interest in this at the minute and the, the scientific medical and pharmaceutical communities, particularly in terms of understanding what's happening in lupus and then using that as a target for therapy. Now, the main cell that makes and secretes this molecule interferon alpha is another type of dendritic cell called a PDC rather than an MDC, which actually stands for plasma cytoid so these PDC cells in our blood make and secrete interferon alpha and what actually activates them to do that usually is again viruses. So in this situation Epstein-Barr virus could be a virus which triggers the MDC cells to make lots of interferon alpha which I say is actually made in large quantities often in lupus. Now what interferon alpha then does is again activate that MDC cell, but in this case potentially not in a good way, in a bad way. We want those MDC cells activated in a good way to control viruses, but when they're in, activated in a bad way, then they can uh, potentially cause autoimmunity <coughs> that you've heard about earlier, and this is the case in lupus. Now another feature of lupus is the source of the material in the body that seems to be like the, the, uh, the coal, if you like, that stokes the fire, is used to stoke the fire that causes the inflammation. That material is actually just debris, as I've called it here, released from dying cells. Now, why are cells dying? Well, actually, in this very moment, in every one of us, millions of cells are dying. Okay? That's just a normal thing. Our body is constantly turning over the cells. The Minda told, told us that our bodies are made up of trillions of cells. Well, a few million of those every second are dying and are being replaced by other cells. So the body having to cope with cells that are dying is just a normal, everyday, natural thing. But again, what may be happening in lupus is the body becomes slightly less efficient at dealing with dying cells. And if dying cells are rapidly cleared away out of our tissues, then they can start to break into pieces, forming this debris. And there's evidence that, to some extent, this debris, which then is, I say, the kind of coal that stokes the fire that drives inflammation in lupus. So what can ha then happen is this debris from the dying cells activates those MVC cells, they then, in this context, activate what are called TH cells, which are then themselves, together again with this debris, activate B cells, which make autoantibodies. The autoantibodies that are 
uh, associated with lupus. Those autoantibodies can then bind to the debris and form what are called immune complexes. That's what can cause the inflammatory damage in things like the kidney damage that can occur, the lymphematous rashes, the vasculitis, <coughs> excuse me, they contribute to all of these, these tissue breaking processes. And also, those immune complexes can again activate the PDC. So you see, we now don't need the virus anymore. We now have a self perpetuating cycle of uh, inflammation and tissue damage. So, that uh, model of what's happening in lupus can help us to understand why there are so many different autoantibodies. Probably amongst those of you here who, who uh, have lupus, some of you will have, many of you will have anti-DNA antibodies, some will have anti-SN, anti-RNP and so on and so forth. It varies a lot from, from one individual to another because they're all made against these bits of things that are coming from, from dying cells. So this is another area that we've looked at in terms of um, trying to use this as a way for maybe working towards better, better diagnosis. And again, using this microarray technology. So here again is our uh, slide, microscope slide. So again, something about this size. But this time, with all the little dots printed onto it, are the different materials from cells that can be recognised by autoantibodies. So that means that then in a single assay, rather than just measuring one, two, three, maybe half a dozen of the, these things, we can measure 50, 60, as many as you like, a hundred different things at the same time. So this is where we apply this technology to look at blood samples from lupus patients. So this time each of the columns is an individual, is a blood sample from an individual lupus patient. And across the rows, each is an individual component from those dying cells, what we call the autoantigens. And where there's a red square, that shows that that particular patient has, in this case, let's say here, uh, quite a few patients there with antibodies to LAR, SSB, which is quite a common one there, or down here, RN, PSN, etc., and so on. So those are, those are the sorts of tests which are done in the clinical laboratories. And yes, this isn't a clinical test, this is our research test, it's not being validated for clinical use. But it's pointing the way to how those tests can be improved. So when, when in the clinic, take a blood sample and say, okay, we're going to test your, we're going to do a blood test. It means that as time goes on, rather than say testing for four, five, six things, we may be at the same time be able to test for 50 things and therefore get a better and earlier diagnosis. And just a very, very preliminary piece of data to show how that could work. Here's applying that same test to other groups of patients and again I must thank Peter for, the, for, for being the, the source of these samples uh, from his clinic but uh, we've got patients with uh, Sjogren's and scleroderma. What's I've highlighted here though is three individuals who have a, a diagnosis of fibromyalgia but we find although you might just be able to see the middle one there there's nothing positive so it is just straight fibromyalgia. There's, no, there's none of these tests that come up positive. But here, this one has got several positives, particularly strong there for, uh, again, LAR, SSB, and then one that's positive for row 52. So that's where a situation where maybe someone, you know, as you all know, diagnosing lupus can be very difficult, and this may help to uh, further the diagnosis, uh, again, as, as Francis Okay, so how can all this sort of knowledge and information be used towards developing better therapies? Well, a bit like um, Dominda was saying, what's happening in inflammation is, is this overstoking of activity of certain cell types. And 
what we can say seems to be happening in lupus is that all of these cell types, the PDCs, the MDCs, the TH cells, the B cells, are in this inflamed, overactive state. Again, it's like they've been overstoked, the boilers have almost bursting, that they're, they're, they're so hot and, and energized. And what we want to do is try to control that. So one way in terms of therapy is say, can we find something that would target all of those cells at the same time? And if not totally switch them off, and certainly reduce their levels of activity, their inflammation. Are there drugs that could, could simultaneously act on all of those cells? Or of course an alternative possibility <coughs> is, could we find a drug that targets just one of those cells, but targets it so effectively that it then totally switches off that cell, let's say, the PDC, which therefore dampens down the activity of all those other cells, because they're all interdependent in this cycle of inflammation. So this is where we come to the, the new drugs for old. What that means is this per thing called drug repurposing. Developing a new drug totally from scratch costs up to one billion dollars. Okay, so between 100 million and 1 billion dollars to develop a new drug for full clinical use. <coughs> so a move that's now becoming quite popular and again is, is the approach we've been taking is this thing called drug repurposing. To say, if you take drugs that are already out there, that have gone through every clinical trial <coughs> needed, are actually being used to treat certain patients with certain conditions, could those very same drugs be actually be useful in something totally different? Because they might have some other activity which is equally valid uh, in, in a uh, therapeutic setting, but is different from the one they were originally designed for. So taking one drug and repurposing it for another indication. And so this is an approach we've taken, and uh, certainly this has been very much helped by funding that you've all helped to raise grant we have from Luke to UK, so thank you very much. Where this started out was we took, as you see, 1360 approved <coughs> drugs, drugs that are already being tried, tried and tested, known to be safe, known to have certain activities. We tested them at four concentrations in our assay system, and we look for their ability to affect the expression of some of those molecules in cells that are involved in driving the activity. In fact, 40 of them. And we tested them on various cell lines. You see that generated a lot of data, okay? Over 800,000 data points that we then had to analyse. So we had to get some of the computer scientists to help us with that because uh, we're not mathematicians. Those are all the molecules we tested them on. That's just a little piece of the data that we came out with. Uh, you can multiply that 100 times for the total data set. And we then ranked them. So this gave us 5,000 rankings of drugs at the different concentrations. And what we picked out from that was certain drugs, some of which are actually used as antibiotics. But what, what we're finding here, they actually have anti-inflammatory properties as well. So things like uh, cephalomandel, lomifloxacin, interestingly, estradiol came up on there. Uh, these are the ones, and the most interesting one here called uh, amlexanox. And we then look further at these, and so for example, we have one lomifloxacin, uh, which is a uh, sort of there, which is a fluoroquinolone antibiotic in terms of how it's used. We showed that it, so we look at all the molecules in a cell that are driving it into this inflammatory state, and lomifloxacin inhibited all of those molecules at the same time. It seemed to have this anti-inflammatory activity, so it can therefore knock down the inflammatory status of the cell. So going forward, can we in this way find repurposing drugs that will have this effect, knock down the interferon alpha made by those PVC cells with the aim of therefore reducing the activity of the MDC and the TH and the B cell which would be removed.
remove the production of also antibodies, hopefully, and take things back to normal. That's just to acknowledge the people who've been involved in this work, as well as me and my colleagues. I've mentioned uh, Peter and other clinical colleagues there, uh, postdocs, technicians, PhD students, and other collaborators. And so, amongst other funders like the MRC and Jones Trust, Lucas UK. Thank you very much.